and still share the video when it's done. So let's start. So hi, everyone, uh, and to the panelists, but also to all the attendees that I cannot see on my screen. We're so excited to have you here. Um, and welcome to the Abolitionist Hour with uh, CPCR and the Digital Abolitionists. So my name is Hannah, and I'm one of the members of the Digital Abolitionist team. And I will be moderating the discussion tonight with Fonda, who is also a member of the Digital Abolitionist, and Kiana will be handling the questions and the chat. Uh, we were so thrilled to be joined by Micah Herskind and Bridget Simpson, two extraordinary abolitionist organizers. So first of all, I will just quickly and briefly introduce the Digital Abolitionists. So we are a group of college um, students and recent college graduates organizing around prison abolition with a particular focus on abolishing the death penalty. We are currently using our website, thedigitalabolitionist.com, as an educational tool for abolition and as a platform to amplify voices of those who are or have been directly impacted. In the spring, we have launched a, a virtual art exhibit called Raw Art, which featured the work of artists on death row. You can view the exhibit on our website. In recent months, we have also organized to stop executions in the state of Missouri and Texas. And our next project, so this is a bit of a teaser, um, is tentatively titled Voices from Inside, and we'll work to foster discussion between thinkers on the, on the inside and on the outside. So tonight, we are so excited to introduce you to Bridgette Simpson and Micah Herskind. Bridgette is a formerly incarcerated activist, advocate, author, and entrepreneur. She spent a decade training in the corporate arena and 10 years in the Georgia's Department of Corrections, receiving up-close training in the penal system. Bridgette now fuses both aspects of her training to educate the masses on the inequalities of the criminal legal system and the pressing need for social justice reform. Micah is a public policy associate at the Southern Center for Human Rights and project coordinator with the Bard Business Campaign. He is also one of the co-creators of 8-2 Abolition, a police and prison abolition campaign which spread widely through social media this summer in response to Campaign Zero's reformist eight can't wait campaign. We're so happy to have Micah and Bridgette here with us tonight. So we're gonna begin with some questions that we at the Digital Abolitionists have prepared. Um, but if you have questions, please do send them into the chat. Kiana will be monitoring and sending them on to us. And we will try to incorporate them into our conversation. So thank you to Bridgette. Micah and Hannah and the rest of our team who have been incredible in putting this together. Um, without further ado, Hannah, why don't you start with our first question? Yes, so let's start with a broad question, which is more about defining the key terms. So what do we mean when we say prison industrial uh, complex abolition? What is your own perspective on that? And either of you can start. Um, let's start with Bridget. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. And um, I took the liberty of actually trying to prepare a little for this. Um, so for me, it's the political visioning of eliminating imprisonment, policing, and all forms of surveillance. And abolition, it also creates a very organic and sustainable alternative to punishment and imprisonment. So that's what I got. Micah? Like, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that um, prison industrial complex is this like big term that is hard to understand and has taken me a long time to feel like I like sort of understand it. Um, the way the abolitionist organization um, Critical Resistance defines it is as the overlapping interests of government and industry to use surveillance, policing, and imprisonment as solutions to economic, social, and political problems. So not just like private prisons or prison laborers, but sort of all of the intersecting interests um, that propel imprisonment and punishment, including our political system itself. Um, and so I, I think the way that I've learned abolition, um, and again, this is a framework developed by critical resistance, is that abolition recognizes that the system is not broken, but rather working as designed, and therefore it's in need of dismantling and not fixing because we're, you know it's not it's not broken. Um, and so the way that I've come to understand abolition is as both as Bridget was saying, 
both the building up and tearing down. So tearing down of systems of prisons and policing and surveillance and the interlocking forces of white supremacy and capitalism, all of that needs to be torn down. Um, but then what are we building up? We're building up all of the systems and ways of relating to each other that we need to actually survive and thrive and be well. Um, how, says Doreen. Um, yeah, I think that's a question we're gonna get into as we go. Um, but that's, that's, yeah, that's sort of the way that I've come to understand abolition. And sort of just a very brief follow up on that before we get to number two with the question how, um, what do you personally see as the timeline when people ask you, well, what do we do now? What's next now? Um, sorry to go off script a little bit, but do you have comments on that right now? Um, what do we do now? I think that's a question that um, I can't answer by myself. Micah can't answer because it's a community that we together as a community have to envision, right? Like we have to figure out ways and um, to deal with the systemic racism that is, and we need to figure out how to attack it at every single angle because it all boils down to capitalism. So how can folks get the actual services that they need right now? right? Like I've never seen a person just outwardly commit a crime that had everything that they needed. I've never seen a cupboard that was full and someone goes outside and steals bread, right? So what the problem is, is poverty, right? And people are policing poverty. So if you dismantle, um, if you dismantle the actual prison industrial complex, which is the building, then there are the people that are still standing so the, the, the better question for me in my head is, what do we do with the people? How can we serve the people that we don't have to put them in cages, right? Like, how can we do that? And that is something that we would all have to get together and figure out as a community, because that is what is missing from the model. Capitalism and a few group of people are the ones that made up the whole prison idea, right? From, from England, right? They made up the whole punitive way because before they were just burning people at the stake for stealing a piece of bread, right? Chopping hands off. So the same collection of people that came together to figure out this preposterous way to, to deal with mankind is the same way that we have to come together as a community to vision and to care and to, to give people the services that they need and, and to give people food that need food and shelter that need shelter. And I think, yeah, Another thing about that is like that, it's so tempting to ask the question, okay, well, what are like, what will it be replaced with? What are we gonna replace prisons and policing with? And it sort of like suggests this process whereby, okay, we're gonna go out and get rid of the policing and the prisons and then we're, you know, they'll, they'll be gone. And so then we gotta figure out what we're gonna do as if it's like this chronological process. Um, and I think that's not the way that I've heard any abolitionists talk about it. Um, and so abolition is really something that we do in real time. It's what we do when we figure out how to take care of each other, how to um, take accountability for the harm that we cause. It's how we support people inside who are organizing for their freedom or even just for their survival. It's how we organize against the system together. And so it's really like we are, we are, building, we are building up abolition as we're tearing down these harmful systems. Thank you both so much for bringing um, up so early this idea of um, not punishing differently, but coming up with different forms of solutions. Um, so a kind of personal question, I feel like so many of us who do this kind of work come to it from such different places. So we were wondering, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you both started organizing for abolition and how you got to um, where you are? Wow. Okay. So, um, like after I graduated from, um, from Rutgers, uh, I actually, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia and, um, long story, short story, I ended up in prison. <laughs> I ended up in prison for, um, for 10 years. It didn't matter if, um, I was innocent of the crime. It didn't matter. None of the things It just mattered that I was a black woman and, um, and I needed to serve time for someone else's crime. And um, I think 
I really got introduced to abolition after I was um, released. And um, I was introduced to movement, period, because uh, for a long time, I thought that um, it was something that I did wrong that put me in the position, not realizing that the deck was already stacked, right? The deck was stacked when um, me, I was born in Jamaica, I'm an immigrant, so I came here and we weren't wealthy, <laughs> we were poor. So the deck, once again, already stacked. And it was stacked before I even had an opportunity to look at my hand. So what led me to abolition was 10 years of incarceration and um, coming home, not being able to um, find, uh, find a, a, a good job, um, needing um, housing, and just realizing that no matter what I did or how I did it, um, the odds were always going to be stacked against me. So it was my job to fight. And then when I started fighting, then I realized that, that if I don't figure out ways to be a part of dismantling the beast, that I will always be subject to some of the, um, the discrimination that I face on a constant basis. Like I'm discriminated against in, in every area. Like they won't let, let me adopt a child. I, uh, I applied for a grant for, um, to help with babies and they, because I'm formerly incarcerated, I'm not even um, able to do that. I was denied on that. So just because of um, rejection, that is why, that is what brought me to um, abolition because I just felt like there had to be a different way a different way as human beings for us to see each other and to deal with um, harm. Yeah, um, I came to abolition in college. Um, I got to college as a white person who had not been personally impacted by the system and I had like read the new Jim Crow and thought I knew what was going on um, and very much started as a reformer and I thought that you know, private prisons were the main evil of our system. Um, and that was the issue. Um, and then I started, um, I got involved with an organization at, um, at my school that was doing some of this work and started learning from the people that I was organizing with. And I started, um, and I got connected with a program um, where people were writing to people in solitary confinement. And just over the years of um, working with people, um, both on campus and then also in the state of New Jersey, organizing against different forms of criminalization, um, got deeper and deeper into it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's always important for me to name that, like, I came to this having no, like, I had all of those same questions. Well, what about this? What about this? What about this? Um, and I think that those are, like, okay to have. Um, and it's also important to work through them in community with people. Okay, thank you so much for sharing your stories. And building on what you were saying, Bridget, you mentioned the concept of harm. So can we talk about what is the difference between harm and between crime, but also the difference between accountability and punishment? So for me, I will always joke and, and, and say, um, and preface before I begin, I will say that, um, you know, like when you're wealthy and white, you um, commit harm, right? <laughs> but when you're poor and black or brown, you commit crime, right? It's, it's pretty much both the same thing, <laughs> but um, the way it's spin, the way white supremacy, the way capitalism, the way this world at large is, that, that, that's what I really see as the true difference. But um, what I wrote was um, harm is moral and crime is political. Likewise with accountability and punishment. Accountability is an internal check that coincides with responsibility, whereas punishment is enforced from without and gives the power for morality to an amoral system. That is what I, I wrote. Yeah, and I think to go off that, like in our, I think in our like popular imagination, harm and crime are seen as synonymous. So if you've committed or been convicted of a crime and you're in prison, that's because you're a bad person. And if you haven't been, it's because you're a good person. Um, right. And I think separating out harm versus crime, harm, harm being 
the ways in which um, we hurt each other, but then also the ways in which our system sets people up to be hurt and the way that our system shortens lives and kills people. Um, and so, so thinking about harm is that, whereas crime is um, a politically constructed concept. And I, so I think that's something that's hard for people to understand, but it's basically to say that, you know, our cr crime is a legal category. So it, crime has been legislated. So what, what forms of harm or even non-harmful things that we choose to call crimes or criminalize, that's what ends up in our, in our criminal code, not things that are harmful. And so there are a lot of people who are committing lots of forms of harm all the time who are not criminalized for that harm. And then there are, um, yeah, and, and, and as Bridget said, blackness, race is criminalized by our system, right? Like this, to, as Bridget said, like to be black and poor, you are walking around criminalized. And so understanding the difference between those things, I think is really important. Um, and then I think, yeah, Bridget nailed the, the difference between accountability and punishment. And I think the one other thing to hit is that there's also like a third category, which is consequences. So if punishment is, we're trying to just inflict pain for the sake of inflicting pain, we're trying to get revenge, that's punishment. Whereas accountability is something that can lead to repair and restoration and also changed behavior to make sure that harm doesn't happen again. Um, but then there's also consequences. So not everybody is going to want to be accountable for the harm they caused. And so saying, you know, a consequence of, of this behavior is you're not welcome in this space anymore where you have the, where you have the potential to do harm to people again, you know. Um, separating out accountability versus consequences versus punishment, I think is really important. Thank you both so much for sort of slicing that so thin. I feel like those terms kind of all get blurred together so much of the time and that's where many of the questions and the problems um, arise in these conversations. Um, and so you both touched on this a little bit earlier, but I wanna come back to this idea of abolition as a presence um, so abolitionist and scholar Ruth Wilson Gilmore describes abolition as a presence, not as an absence. So what does that mean, first of all, to you? And um, how can this framework guide us as abolitionists? So to me, um, folks look at abolition and fright because they think of it as just a, a, a demolition, right? A, a tearing down even though um, that is exactly what needs to happen, right? Like the prison industrial complex, all of the complexes need to collapse, right? Because they were fundamentally based on capitalistic views, capitalistic morals and, um, and violence, right? We can just be um, frank here. It was all um, perpetuating violence. So um, abolition is not just about demolishing, right? But it's also about building and it's also about envisioning a, a future right now like not looking just at yesterday or potentially tearing down but like micah said it's starting right now like it's um it's it's building as a community together like to thwart some of the harm that this system has caused people it's feeding people because they're hungry right it's um it's actually giving a person that is mentally ill the services that they need as opposed to just throwing them away so the presence is right now the presence is you the presence is me it's us together building out a collective future right like a future from today but starting right here right now building the world that we want to see that we want to be a part of where there's um where there's not a person that has 50 billion and then there's somebody that has nothing and not being okay with that and not um and not feeling like because capitalism is real that it gives everybody else an opportunity to suffer because they didn't have they weren't afforded the same opportunities as the billionaire tycoon right so that is what i believe she means when she talks about presence the presence it's me it's you like it's in the vision that we have to make a better tomorrow today yeah, and I think like just like a, a key 
abolitionist question that I've heard is like, what makes you feel safe? What makes you feel safe in your home or, you know, on a daily basis? And like, in those conversations, like what, you know, there, there's this link in our head between, oh, well, prisons exist. And so, you know, does that make us safe? And like, when you think about what allows people to live healthy, safe lives, you think about things like stable housing and enough food to eat and enough money to live and right just like all stable transportation like all of the all of the different things that you yourself could think of of like oh like what makes me feel safe and like I'm doing okay and that I'm feeling good like those are the things that we need more of and that we want to build that presence of um and so yeah I think that again like abolition as a building project as something that is trying to build safety and recognizing that prisons are not keeping people safe and that there are other things that do keep people safe. And so let's build those things and, and, you know, tear down the things that don't make people safe in the process. Okay, thank you so much for this. Um, so our next question is about um, practicing abolition. So what is the most difficult dilemma that you have, that you have been faced with with your organizing work and in your life as an abolitionist? It can be a time when you face the difficulties coming from others or like an internal dilemma or anything, any problem that you had to solve and you had this moment of, should I call the police? Wait, no, actually I have to do something else. Wow. <laughs> so when I saw this question, it, um, whew, I had to just take um, a, a deep breath um, simply because, um, I believe that every time you declare something in the universe, um, it has a way of coming back to you. So I am an abolitionist, so I don't believe in policing. I don't believe in jails. I don't believe in anything that will cause um, detriment to human. I do believe that when we cause harm, that there are different ways of accountability that we can all draw up for ourselves. I had someone who was very, um, very close to me. I won't go deep into the story, um, but we were in, into partnership together and um, she was very dishonest and she removed um, a great sum of money. <laughs> she did. And um, there was the option and that was the option that um, a lot of people would have exercised because um, according to the world standards, according to America and the capitalistic system that um, we needed to make sure she went to a cage. We needed to charge her with this and charge her with that. But um, knowing that she was a poor girl from the projects who went through foster care, who um, had to fight um, pretty much for every piece of everything that she has and realizing that um, her environment created her and we are a part of that environment and we like to take our hands off when it's sticky but when it's nice and pretty we like to pet it so at that moment in time i had to choose to be an abolitionist though the money was gone <laughs> yes and the friendship was gone but the abolition was there and the way i wanted to live my life and the way i want to model my life and the way i want to be an example to the children that I bring into this world and to the people that are around me, that calling the police is what we were taught to do, but that's not something that is innate, is what we were taught. So yeah, that was a very hard situation. Micah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's just, um, you know, we have these conversations and we read think pieces and books and all of it is really good and like grounding yourself in the principles of abolition is really important and also when you're trying to practice it we're living in this you know we're living under this really horrible system of racial capitalism and so things are really messy and things are really sticky and when you you know try to you know when you I, something that I've learned from Mariam Kaba is that accountability is not something that we impose on people. It's not something that we say, like, we're going to do accountability to you. Accountability is something that is taken. You have to take accountability. And so, you know, being in a situation where you, you know, you can't coerce and impose accountability on someone when they don't want to be accountable, that's really hard. And then you need to come together in different ways and think, 
how are we going to move past this? Are there other people we can get involved who that person will be accountable to? Um, do we have to move on and say, you know, we, we can't be in relationship with this person anymore? You know, what, it's just that all of, all of the theory is much more complicated when we're living in this really complicated world. And so, um, and I think that that's, that's the reason that the principles are so important. But um, yeah, situations like the one that Bridget described um, are just really hard. And I think you can't figure them out unless you're working with other people and able to talk and debrief and plan. Um, and yeah, I mean, the world is horrible in a lot of ways. And so abolition isn't gonna be some like clean, neat, eight step, process it's going to be something that's messy that you know we're figuring out daily and making mistakes and then just to add one thing to it and and then it's also about accountability not just for that person but just for yourself and that means that you will be honest and tell the truth it doesn't matter what the truth looks like if it's ugly if it makes you look bad if it makes you look foolish but telling the truth and being accountable and having the openness to be held accountable. So, yeah. So those were a lot of things that I experienced in that one, one, um, one example. Thank you both so much for discussing um, how complicated and how messy it could be because I feel like so frequently um, people try to argue back and try to make their case against it by pointing out the fact that, oh, like it's not doable because it's so complicated, but of course it's so necessary that um, to acknowledge the messiness seems to be the first step. Um, so this summer after um, the murder of Mr. Floyd, prison and police abolition have been in the headlines more than they have been um, earlier this year or possibly ever before. And as people who have been practicing abolitionism and um, organizing for it for so long, I was wondering how the recent protests and uprisings across the country have affected your abolitionist organizing work. Well, in, in some ways, it, um, it was just like a, a match um, that ignited a fire that was already like burning brightly. But for the first time, um, because it was just so many people there because normally in, um, in the fight, it's maybe, it's maybe the same 50 of us in Atlanta that go around and around. Um, speaking of closing, closing facilities that aren't bringing us any uh, public safety. And we talk night and day. <laughs> But after, um, after Mr. Floyd, after Ray Shard Brooks, um, after Breonna Taylor, say her name, her murderer still is not punished. Um, but after those three, something happened, not to mention um, the layer of COVID, because I do believe that COVID was actually the catalyst because people were at home, people were unemployed, people were glued to their phones, people were glued to the TV. So they were now in the know, right? Because let's talk about Oscar Kane, who was my comrade, who was murdered in Atlanta. There were seven murders before Rayshard, like um, under, under the, the city of Atlanta's watch. There were so many people, Jimmy Atchison <laughs> before they were, but COVID wasn't here then. So everybody couldn't see what was going on with black bodies and why the system of policing that was going on locally in Atlanta needed to stop nationally. You know, um, no one could see that because once again, people were on the go. People were too busy to be concerned with abolition. People were too busy to be concerned with black bodies, brown bodies dropping like flies with systemic racism, but COVID, COVID was the catalyst that lit the match. And I could literally say, I've never protested in the rain, but during this time, we flat out protested in the rain. So um, yeah, it, it, it definitely um, brought a lot of um, attention, a lot of noticing, a lot of um, people standing up that would have traditionally sat down, a lot of young people 
I think that was the most beautiful thing that I saw when I would see little seven-year-olds with their fists elevated um, and, and saying no more prisons, no more jails. To me, that, is, that was just my snapshot into abolition, into our future. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I mean, obviously there's so much more attention right now on abolition and that's like a word that has been mainstreamed so quickly. Um, and I think something that a lot of people have been thinking about in the last couple of months is how as things go mainstream, they also get co-opted and watered down. And we've seen that in a lot of different ways. Um, a lot of, you know, abolitionist language that is being turned towards just restructuring and recreating the things that we're actually trying to destroy. And so we're seeing um, in language like reimagining policing, when really the original phrase is reimagining safety. Um, and so I think that it's both really exciting to see a lot of people um, engage because we we need people. <laughs> There's We need people working on everything. Um, and also it is a moment in which we need to be careful about um, really honoring um, the legacy of abolition um, and then, you know, <laughs> working working towards a future that will actually eliminate these things rather than reproduce them in nicer or softer ways. Yeah, and, and so like um, for me personally, especially during this time, um, like when I came home from prison, I really hit the ground running because like when I watched like George uh, Floyd and the knee in his neck, like I thought about um, my brother, um, I thought about my brothers, like I thought about my black father, I thought about um, with Breonna, I thought about my black mom, right? Like, um, but like the gentleman that um, that died, uh, Mr. Floyd, he's like, my, my brothers are huge, right? Like my brother, Sion, he is huge, like six, 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 seven, I mean, huge black men that have to like, you know, walk a certain way so they don't intimidate people. And I was very sad that that man lost his life, but I was so glad that the awareness was brought so that they would at least be able to defend themselves a little better, if that makes sense. Does. Thank you both so much for sharing that um, with us. And um, I mean, if there's anything good that came out of COVID, I guess it was the fact that people slowed down and saw what they otherwise would have been too busy or just able to be blind to and not feel too bad about it because they were quote unquote busy. You know, thank you for bringing that up. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much for your insight. And I think that for the next question, it sort of ties into that and this COVID moment. I think that what we saw on Twitter was that a lot of people were starting to realize how policing actually works and how prison actually works. So uh, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions that people who haven't been directly impacted by the criminal legal system have? And what are the most effective ways to challenge these misconceptions? The biggest misconceptions are a lot. I think um, someone that hasn't um, actually been inside of a cage may, well, they, they can't possibly understand um, what, it, what it is like to actually um, sleep in that, that cell and to share that small space with another person, to um, have no privacy, like to have to be strip searched at any time, like that your body, your person, nothing of yours is yours right and to be broken like an animal pretty much and to be shackled next to one another like literally like people unless you've been through it you cannot fully understand that you know you you can't and then if you have not dealt with the collateral consequences of being incarcerated or being system impacted where you can't get a job you can't get a place to live you can't get your basic needs met like because of that like if you're always xed out the highest growing homeless population is formerly incarcerated people so um what i like to keep in mind 
I always want to show grace to invite people into my narrative, but to be very clear is to say that, um, you know, it's cliche, but you haven't walked a mile in my shoes, nor do I wish it on you. But the biggest misconception that I see is right and wrong, the perception of law and order without keep taking into account the fact that the deck was already stacked against us. And it was continued to be stacked with, with poverty. Like when my brother was five, six, and he was in school, they were pretty much fitting him for a prison cell. They gave him an aptitude test. When that is what they do in black communities, right? They give them an aptitude test to see who will fill the jail cell, school to prison pipeline. So if you don't know all the pieces, you cannot make an informed decision. Yeah, I'm going to um, take the question from a different angle of, I see a lot of other white people becoming really interested in abolition right now. And so I just want to speak to them, which I think one of, one of the biggest misconceptions is, you know, learning about abolition, that abolition is going to be something that we do to or for people who are inside prisons, as opposed to something that needs to happen with people who are inside prisons, people who are inside who are organizing for their own freedom or survival. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to see abolition become, you know, co-opted by white saviorism, especially especially from other white people who are um, starting to learn about this and thinking like, oh well, you know, we're we're gonna go do this, right? Like it's some that's that's not where abolition is gonna come from. And so, yeah, I think that that is um, a misconception that is important to to name really early on and be be clear about. Yeah, it's definitely not saving being a savior, but is helping to empower, helping folks to be able to fish for themselves, as opposed to thinking that the way that you can rescue us is to continue to give us fish, but not showing us ways to fish for ourselves so we end up in the same poverty ridden hole we were in the, in the first place. Thank you both so much for these comments. Thank you. So um, sort of along the line of, I guess, I guess, well-intentioned missteps, I suppose, um, can we, can you both talk a little bit about the perils of reform, as we say? Um, so in the current moment, we have seen so many calls for the release of either nonviolent offenders or those who are deemed, quote unquote, low risk. Could you elaborate on why this strategy is harmful and, as um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore says, how this system tries to, quote, move the line of what counts as criminal to encompass and engulf more and more people into the territory of prison eligibility? How can we ensure the changes we call for do not entrench the very institutions we wish to transform? I don't really think that I, I could say it much better <laughs> than, um, than her. Um, I just think the false dichotomies that they place on crime and punishment, um, I think it was definitely created um, and, and covered in, in reform. And I see a lot of um, abolitionists who say they're abolitionists, right? who will say, oh, this is a step in the right direction, or this is the first, you know, this is the first bite, but the, the next bite will be bigger. And I never see that to be true, right? Like I, uh, when I work and I do the advocacy and, and, um, and work on policies, and I, and I fight just the same because one person out of prison is a is, is million dollars to me, right? So I fight just the same, even though the, policies, they don't impact me, right? Like it's for people who like, um, what they like to say is nonviolent offenders, right? Like, um, I think the system is violent. And I think that the way that um, folks are incarcerated 
and the way that um, women, even with feminine hygiene products, that's violent, <laughs> the way that they do women inside of um, prisons. And um, I definitely think that they do that to keep us trapped in the hamster wheel and reform is no way demolition. The system, it does not work. It has been proven time and time again from inception. The purpose of, of prisons in the first place was after the Civil War. It was, again, to extract free labor from Black people, right? So we know that when they try to say, oh, this person is not as bad because they just, you know, they just took a little bite to eat. But this person took a whole pocketbook. So that person is a monster. No, they both had a need. They both had a need and they went about trying to satisfy their need differently. But it doesn't make either of them monsters. That means to give them the services that they need and stop trying to separate them. Because that reminds me of like, um, like when America gave um, poor white people the race promise. And that's the same thing that they're doing within the, the, the legal system. So you'll have a set of people, oh, well, I didn't do something that bad. I'm not a murderer. I didn't molest anybody. And that is all done purposely. Yeah, there is so much to say about this because, I mean, basically the history of, I, there's, a, there's a tendency to think that the way that we, you know, we built mass incarceration was because a bunch of Republicans had too much power. Um, and understanding that liberals have laid the groundwork in a lot of ways for what we know as mass incarceration today is incredibly important. People who have constantly tried to, you know, fix or improve the system, um, it's almost always had the impact of expanding the system. Um, I think one, one thing we're really seeing today, which Ruth Wilson Gilmore writes a lot about, is this divide between violent, nonviolent. And so mm -hmm. saying, oh, well, you know, these people are deserving of freedom, these people are not. Or, you know, best case scenario, someone says, well, we're gonna go for the low hanging fruit first, we're gonna try to get out these people who aren't as bad, um, you know, then we'll go later. Um, and in practice, that's just not how it's working. So, I mean, this, this is what I do my research on, actually. And like, so, for example, New Jersey is praised as this really progressive state that's reduced its, popu its prison population by 11,000 people since um, 2000. And so everyone's just like, wow, we got to do what New Jersey's doing. Um, and then when you look at what New Jersey's done in 1999, 57% um, of people who were in New Jersey prisons were there for a nonviolent offense. And today, it's over 75%. So all we've done basically through these different reforms is we've said, we actually just need to whittle down to the people who really deserve to be in prison. We just need to actually get like the real bad guys. And that group gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so even as we're campaigning in the name of, oh, people shouldn't be in prisons. We don't want to continue to do this to people. We're actually solidifying the reality of imprisonment for people down the road. Um, I would definitely suggest Survived and Punished. New York just put out this, or well, a couple months ago, put out this amazing report looking at some um, reforms happening in New York right now and how, you know, even under the guise of progressivism, how they're actually expanding the scale and power of the system. Um, and so, sorry, just one more thing is people then say like, okay, well, what do you want us to do if, you know, if reform doesn't work? Um, and I think a concept that's been really helpful for me has been non-reformist reform, which maybe is like a clunky term, um, but basically reforms that take away power or legitimacy or resources or authority from the system. So we never want to give more power or resources or legitimacy to the system. And so you have people talking about, oh, well, we're going to, you know, build this jail in order to get rid of this one. And now all we've done is build another jail that then we later have to try to take down. And so, you know, operating on the concept of we never want to build or affirm anything in our work right now that later we're going to have to come back to and then argue against. I think that's one of the most important sort of principles of evolution especially like with like the war on drugs right like because the war on drugs was essentially they said that they were making improvements right like they were going to um, target all of the 
black drug dealers um, and all of, you know, all of the other folks, they were going to target them, right? But that, just that actual error, the, the Ronald Reagan and being tough on crime and the, the McGruff, the crime dog, and all of that, that is what we're dismantling right now. And if you look at it, even with crack cocaine, right, like a white person will get charged with cocaine versus a black person that will be charged with crack, the same substance, right, the same substance and get different time. Like two people can commit the same exact crime. And if you are black or brown, you're going to do more of your time. You're going to get more time. A lot of times, like if you look at it, like there are, um, you know, white children are, their uh, parents are called because they made a mistake. Whereas, you know, poor black or brown children, they're going to juvie, right? And then even if you look at the disparities with women, women are going to do the majority of their time, 500% more of their time. Like, and that started with the, um, the war on drugs, right? Women were getting all their property seized. If they even knew someone, their boyfriend was selling drugs they were going to get more time than their boyfriend and they were going to do the majority of their time. So like, it's very, very important for us not to, in the name of reform, take a step forward to only take 50 steps back. Yeah. I think that the next question is pretty much tied to this question of institutions and reforms, et cetera. It's a great question from Bree who asked, uh, what is the role of abolition in electoral politics? And she's saying that she's feeling really confused about whether there are any use at all in participating in electoral politics. Wow, this is a question that Mike and I hope that <laughs> no one talked about, actually. But um, it's a good. It's a yeah. It's a good question. It, it, um, it is. <laughs> Go yeah. ahead, you start, Mike. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, yeah, Brie and I were joking. <laughs> Let's not talk national politics. Um, I, I mean, the way that I've come to understand electoral organizing is that elections are one terrain of struggle of many through which we can open up space for more organizing. So we're never going to see abolition through, um, through legis like through you know new legislation, we're not going to legislate abolition. Um, we're not going to elect the person who's going to um, you know bring us abolition. It's not it's not going to be this top down process. Um, and so too often we look at like who we're voting in as like well that's the work we're doing. We just got to get people in. Um, and so I I do see um, sort of electoral politics as one area to ideally open up space for communities to be able to organize for their own autonomy and survival and expand mutual aid and all those things. Um, and so I think it's important, but it's also like, let's, let's be very clear that we're not, like legislation's not going to save us. What, you know, certain elected officials are not going to save us. Um, and, that, and that doesn't mean that it's not worth paying attention to what's going on either. So, um... Like, I totally agree um, with Micah. And I also um, feel that, like, when you are attacking a beast, you have to um, deploy several ways. And um, voting is one, right? Like, you have to, you know, like, um, when if you look at the military forces, there's a Navy, there's an Army, there's a, you know, there's a um, Air Force. And, and, and for a very specific reason. You have to be able to attack your enemy in all fronts. So electorally, that is something that um, folks died for. So the importance of it, sometimes you can't tell which side is, is, was, is, is good or bad. But we can say that you exercising your right to vote on who you choose to like to lead and who you choose to make accountable because it doesn't just stop once they get into office right like most people just go to the polls and vote and just leave it there you feel like you've done your job but abolition says we will hold these folks accountable to us who elected them like the mayor of atlanta i know she's so sick of seeing my face because she has to be held accountable because she was elected by the people 
which means that she works for the people. So whomever you place your vote behind, you have to not just vote, but you have to hold them accountable. Because that, after all, that is what abolition is about, right? Finding ways, because politicians cause harm, right? When they tell you that they're going to do one thing and they go in and they do, you know, demolish things and put up, you know, different type of shopping centers, that's causing harm to a community who needs a, a school, who needs food, clothing, and this is what you do. So how do you hold that person accountable? You most certainly just don't say, oh my gosh, I can't believe they did that. No, you go down to that city hall, you go to whatever it is that's necessary, and you make your voice be heard, and you let them know. And if not, then you exercise your right to do nothing. Thank you both so much. And also thank you to our participants who are um, asking these questions. They're wonderful and um, members of our team are keeping track of them and listing them out for us. So thank you to them also. Um, so sort of, we had one question prepared similar to one that an audience member is asking. So I'm gonna try to combine the two of them. And it's about engaging with people who are either hostile to or skeptical of the idea of abolitionism. Um, so our question was, how do you approach a discussion with someone who is against abolition, especially if this is someone you're close to, um, kind of like, you know, your uncle, your grandfather, someone like that. And an audience member followed up with a question that said, how should we engage with slash persuade skeptics of abolitionism who believe incarceration is a necessary response to gender-based violence in particular? Yeah. So, I mean, as, as someone who has had a lot of conversations with people that have gone very poorly, <laughs> um, I'll say, I think, I think, you know, in these conversations, all of like the gotcha questions come up immediately, right? Like, what are you going to do instead? What about this scenario in which this person does this thing and it's really horrible? It's the worst thing we can imagine that someone does to someone. Um, and an, an instinct of mine is to try to provide the answers to say, well, you know, this is what restorative justice is. And so this is, you know, this is what's going to happen, or this is what community accountability looks like. So this is what we're going to try to do. Um, and, you know, try to give answers to each of these things. Um, and a tactic that I've found much more useful recently is let's just start at where we are and say, like, do we find it morally acceptable that we have over 2 million people in cages, that we have many, many more on probation or parole or under state surveillance? Do we find it acceptable that there are millions of people living in poverty? Do we find it acceptable that the police are killing, especially Black people all the time? Do we find those things acceptable? No. And so if we don't, then we actually don't need to have all the answers for like what this new system is going to look like. Actually, instead of like me trying to give you every single answer, I'm just gonna try to invite you into the conversation and say, like, well, what do you think we could do instead of calling the cops? Like, okay, like, let's think about this. So our friend does this and it really hurts someone. Like, who can we get involved in that situation to try to stop the harm from happening, um, to, to talk it out and see how we might be able to repair that harm? You know, like what, how can we use our imaginations that like, Angela Davis talks about this, so many abolitionists talk about this, is that it's it's a very imaginative project. And so actually like inviting people in to try to answer those questions together, because we know what we have right now is completely morally unacceptable. That, you know, that I think that's one tactic is saying like, yeah, I don't know, I don't have all the answers. I just know that what we have right now is reprehensible. And so let's try to figure out something else. So I don't think that I could say it better <laughs> than uh, Micah. Um, and that is the truth. Like with abolition, it's the open-ended question that we get to answer together, that we as a community get to um, build out together. I know that um, me serving 10 years, um, it didn't reduce, <laughs> it didn't re reduce any type of public safety. Um, it didn't, it didn't help me, you know, the whole um, theory of, um, you know, that it will be some type of the Department of Corrections or there will be some type of reform or that is just um, false. So what ab ab abolition is, is the invitation, is the invitation to the presence. 
the invitation for us to build and vision together. That means that if you see someone that's hungry, let's get together and let's go and feed that person. If there's someone without shelter, let's get together and figure out how we as a community can do that. See, prison and jail, the prison industrial complex at large, it really just hides societal problems. It doesn't fix them. Because if they're a person that is um, addicted to drugs, if they serve 20 years and they did not treat their drug addiction, they will continue to be chemically addicted. So um, abolition invites us all into the narrative. So that's what um, I do. I invite folks into the narrative. And a question that's come up specifically a couple times in the chat um, and in the questions is, what about sexual assault specifically? And that's a really, really important question. Um, and I definitely don't have all the answers. Um, I think that's another place where we can start and say, does what we have is what does what we have right now does that handle and prevent sexual assault in a way that's acceptable to us right we have you know if prisons kept us safe or stopped sexual assault you would think that we would probably live in the safest country in the world as the country with the biggest prison system in the world and yet prisons themselves are sites of a lot of sexual violence and we have rampant sexual violence most of which is not reported to the police outside of prisons and so you know again i think that's a really important question and there are a lot of people doing work around that so the book beyond survival is really really good um, the book the revolution starts at home is also worth reading reading about community accountability and transformative justice and restorative justice those things are all being, you know, experimented with in real time. Um, but again, I think we have to start from a, you know, a point of recognizing that actually what we have right now is not working. It's not stopping sexual assault. And so again, let's think about how we can actually prevent it from happening in the first place. Thank you. Um, I think I so we have this really fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we have this question from Madison. It's quite long, so I'm going to try to summarize it. Um, but essentially, um, she's asking about um, how um, with um, yeah. uh, abolitionists still talk about how police who have been murdered who have murdered black people in the streets have not been have not been punished, or people who do enormous violence to thousands or hundreds of thousands of people get a slap on the wrist for their white collar crimes. How do we reconcile the idea of fairness that these privileged people should be held accountable in proportion with the punishment imposed on poor people? Of or people of color uh, with the idea that punishment is not beneficial and what does justice look like for the police officers that murdered Breonna Taylor? This is a, I mean, yeah, this is a conversation that's come up a lot, um, is especially around the call to arrest the killers of Breonna Taylor. Um, and I think that it's incredibly understandable why that would be a rallying cry for a lot of people. Um, I heard Amanda Alexander, who's a, a lawyer in um, Detroit, talk about, you know, when we've been told our whole lives that one thing is what justice is, that arrests are what justice is, you know, it's gonna make sense that a lot of people are gonna call for arrests. Um, but again, this is where imagination comes in and we think about like, what's one, for, I mean, first of all, I'll say justice is not going to be a top-down thing. Like survivors of harm and the communities that have been harmed, like that's who, you know, that's where justice needs to emanate from. Um, I think one way of thinking about justice for Breonna Taylor and others who have been um, killed or harmed is like, what if we abolish the police department that took Breonna Taylor's life? Andrea Ritchie and Mariam Cabo wrote a really good, a really good article um, that I would recommend finding, maybe we can drop the link in the chat um, about why, you know, an arrest of Breonna Taylor's killer wouldn't, wouldn't be justice and why that wouldn't actually solve any of the underlying issues that lead to police murders. Um, and so, yeah, these are really complicated and sticky questions. Um, but I, I think, again, we need to start from the premise that like, our system is not actually, our, our prison system is not designed to stop harm. It actually causes a lot of harm. And so trying to like, turn it into something that's suddenly going to keep the people safe who it actually most often harms, that's not a realistic goal. Wow. So, um, I think that um, police and the system of policing is what killed 
Breonna Taylor. Um, the lawlessness, the extra um, power that was given to police officers, especially during the war on drugs, the initial reasoning, the history of policing, um, just um, convict trading, all of the things um, that the history of policing brings, the KKK having so much power within the police force, um, just policing is what killed George Floyd. And it was the buy-in into policing that continues to kill us. It is the fact that um, we've been taught, right? Like, um, though people, though people say Willie Lynch, that was fictitious, that he was fictitious, but the person that wrote it was very real. And the impact that he left was very real. Says if you teach the mother, she will teach the children. So the fear that is perpetuated and taught through generations of generations, the trust that is given to police officers by generation and generation, that is what is killing us. It is not improving public safety. So policing, the system of policing, that is what slayed Breonna. Yeah. And the lack of accountability and just the blue shield that those folks stand behind and the lack of accountability, it, it, it's, it's, it's just disgusting. And the other, the other part of that question that I forgot is um, thinking about white collar crime. And so all, all, of, all of that that goes completely unpunished or is actually often, <laughs> is not even illegal in the first place. And so I think, I think thinking about economic exploitation, all of the wage theft that happens, the fact that we have a system in which immense wealth for just a few people is premised on the immense poverty of many millions more, like, you know, it, that, that harm that people are committing, like, would it put, would it make people better off if we just put those people in cages? Like, no, maybe justice for that would be like redistributing all of their money, right? Like, not having a society in which we have billionaires or million, you know, like, so just, just being more creative and like what actually would stem the harm as opposed to like, well, you did something bad, so throw you in a cage and then we'll forget about it. Thank you both so much for those incredible answers to a question that I feel like is not asked enough and um, is something that I really wanna talk to some of my own friends about. Um, so this is kind of interesting. I feel like recently um, a lot of public figures have been talking about, well, what is the image of a world without um, prisons, what is the abolitionist ideal? And people have been saying, well, it looks like a white suburb, right? But um, so the question is from Jason, could you talk about um, taking from Tamara Knopper's article, abolition is not a suburb, why the image of safety in white suburbs um, is not exemplary of the abolitionist imaginary? Because it's not inclusive. Abolition is inclusive. It is inclusive of all people. It's a place where we all can live and breathe and have all of the resources that we need. As they say, a white suburb would imply <laughs> that there are, there's only white people there. And a suburb, you know, or, or even this, um, this black on black crime, right? Like um, there's more white on white crime <laughs> than there is black on black crime, but it's, it's more Mexican on Mexican crime. It's more Jamaican on Jamaican crime because it's the people who you are most around are the people who you harm the most. So um, that white suburb is no way, like the KKK, when I think of white suburbs, I think the KKK lives there. I think, oh my gosh, like, um, you know, like when I go to certain neighborhoods, just being a black woman and then being formerly incarcerated, I just 
like, oh my gosh, let me make sure I drive below the speed limit so I don't get pulled over. So that is not the version of the world I want to live in. I want to be included in my own vision of what um, abolition is. But I do know that there's no police and the colors are vibrant. And I look around and if I want to go up the street, I can get some Jamaican food. I can go down the street and, you know, get some Cuban food. I can go up the street, get some Italian food. Like I would consider it to be all inclusive. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that is a really good essay by Tamara Knopper. Um, I think that, and, and th that was like, that phrase has turned, I think that, so Miriam Kaba is one of the people who has used the phrase like, look at the suburbs. And people, I think people have taken that as like the suburbs, especially the white suburbs are like a model of abolition. And I don't think that any of the, any of, the, I like certainly Miriam Kaba, but like, I don't think that anyone who was used, who has used that phrase would say like, we need to make the, the world a suburb. Because I mean, the, the suburbs are premised on exploitation, on white flight, on, you know, on all of these horrible forms of oppression. And so, I, I think that how people use, how I've seen um, it used as a rhetorical device is to say, you know, these people in the suburbs who are saying, oh, we could never be safe without prisons or police, you actually don't really have police on your streets, right? Like that, so like, I think in part it's to point out the hypocrisy of the people who are often most opposed to abolition are the people who are sort of living, and again, this is not all suburbs, but who are often living in like a police-free area already. Um, and so I think that that has its uses as a way to like sort of break the the perceived connection between police and safety. But I don't I don't know any um, serious abolitionists who would say that we're trying to make just a bunch of white suburbs, you know, across across the country. And there, um, like last year, we were at City Hall, and when um, Police Chief Shields was still um, the police chief. We remember telling her that make the police officers that work in our neighborhoods live there. Like, don't allow them to live in the suburbs and then work in the urbanized areas. Let them live where they work. And then I guarantee you that they would have different views of it. Because policing in the suburbs is very different from the over-policing that happens in the rest of, the, um, the rest of Atlanta. And I just remember, um, like, I just remember her saying, oh, like, we don't want, why would we disrupt their homes? Why would we disrupt their homes? The same reason you've been disrupting ours. So when I think of, um, when I think of a suburb, I think of, yeah, KKK. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think of. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, I think that the next question is a more practical one. So we know that there are a lot of students on this call. So how can we as students and as individuals actively participate and contribute to abolition in our, day, in our daily lives? Well, um, I think it's important to just um, get involved, not in just the ideal of abolition, but in actual abolition, right? Like, because a lot of us read books and articles and romanticize of this world, but we're not ready to get our hands dirty. And what that means is if someone steals something from you, um, the first thing that the abolitionists <laughs> might do is call the cops. Like, oh no, they stole. But it means getting your hands dirty. It means to get involved in um, mutual aid projects, right? Like to get involved in letter writing campaigns. It means to actually not just think about this system, right? Because the system that we wish to abolish is the prison, right? But what about the people? Abolitionists not only want to demolish and dismantle the system, but they want to, in, to lift up and to elevate the people. The people. So. I would encourage students to get involved, get involved and to reach out to different organizations that um, elevate the cause of um, having um, connections with folks who are inside, um, um, get with formerly incarcerated people who are moving work and 
elevate their leadership, elevate their power. If there's something that they might not know, help them. So for me, that is the way I feel like you have to roll your sleeves up. And at some point reading is just not, you know, enough. It's fundamental, but it's not enough. Yeah, I feel like back when in, in-person panels were a thing, there's like, you know, at the end of the panel, everyone, you know, there's always someone who comes up and says, well, what can we do? Because they just learned about this horrible thing that's happening. And so it's like, what can we do? And often like the subtext behind the question is like, what can I do in the next 15 minutes or the next day to make myself feel a little bit less bad about the horrible thing I just learned about? And like, the fact is, it's going to require like, a life orientation shift for people who really want to change something. And so like, if you're a student, who's organizing on campus? Who's organizing with the workers on campus? Who's, or, you know, who's organizing in your city? Can you support them? Universities have a lot of resources. How can you take the, the resources from your university and direct it into the community and into the people who are doing work there? Like there are very concrete ways to try to redistribute resources to offer research, um, research capacity to, you know, all of, all of the things that students can do. Um, you can be on the front lines. You can join an organization, look at who's doing the work in your city, right? Like, there are a lot of ways that we need to be taking action as opposed to, you know, reading about, and, and the reading is important too, like being in community with people and doing political education work and pushing our boundaries is really important. But at the end of the day, you know, all of that is for nothing if we're not, you know, getting involved in some way. Thank you both so much. And um, the Digital Abolitionists, our team, we don't pretend to know everything in any way, but um, if you would like to get involved in our Unsure Why in long-term projects or um, in local organizations, please do email us or um, message us on Twitter or something like that, and we'd be happy to talk to you about ways that you would like to get involved, um, especially if you're in college, because many of us are college students, and um, that's what we know best. So please do reach out if you're looking for ways to get involved. I just muted myself. Um, so this is a question for you both. And we were wondering, um, we talked about sort of your brief bios at the very beginning of this um, talk. And I was wondering if you could both talk a little bit about your biggest upcoming projects or current projects related to abolitionism and um, ways that you're getting involved. Well, because um, we're working on something together. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'll talk about um, the project that we're working on together. Well, we're actually working That's on we're getting both together. together. <laughs> okay, you talk about the person. So I'll talk about, um, so Bard Business is actually an initiative um, that was birthed out of um, the SBA, um, not granting formerly incarcerated people um, access to disaster relief loans. Um, formerly incarcerated business owners were not able to um, get any monies because of the fact that we were formerly incarcerated. So um, we just tag teamed and just said, you know what, that's not fair. Enough is enough. And we started a GoFundMe and raised almost $100,000 in, um, in less than two months. And we regranted that money to different small businesses that were formerly incarcerated um, because at the end of the day like um, we have to have us we have to have ways and um, and just visions on how we can create a better tomorrow right from here from right where the point we are today so if you guys want more information please check us out and we are at um, bardbusiness.org, and you can learn more about the initiative. You will see my face up there, Micah's up there, and um, we have another partner. Her name is Denise Rubin, um, and she's up there as well. And I will kick it to Micah. Yeah, um, and, and so on that, like, mutual aid is, like, that's an abolitionist practice. Um, and so I, even just looking into, like, who's doing mutual aid work in your city, that's another place to start. Um, but a second project that um, Bridget and I and a bunch of other amazing um, people here in Georgia are at the very beginning of um, is we are working on trying to um, create sort of a statewide um, network of people who are writing to folks in prisons. And so this is another thing is like, you know, if you want to, if you want to learn more about abolition, if you want to 
be involved in abolition, you should be in contact with people who are in prison. So like write to someone who's in a prison in your state. And what we're trying to do right now is build out a program where we can connect the 55,000 people who are in Georgia state prisons with people on the outside and start to build some power and capacity across prison walls. And so um, really it's at the very beginning, but we're really excited about that as well. That's fantastic. And um, about letter writing, there's been this really incredible group that we have been trying to partner with called Emilio, and we can definitely email information about this later, where they facilitate um, mailing of um, family members or friends or others who want to write to incarcerated people. Um, so we will send out information about that in a follow-up email also. Exactly. Uh, thank you both for sharing. So I think that this is pretty much the end of the questions that we wanted to ask. Um, so briefly before we end and we say thank you to everyone, uh, we just wanted to highlight two action items um, who are really important. So the first one is related to death penalty abolition. Um, so something that has gone really un underreported over the past month is the fact that the federal, gov the federal government resumed execution after 17 years hiatus. So death penalty action has launched an organizational letter to Congress that groups can sign and a petition for individuals. So we will send everyone a follow-up email with the petition. So if you have the opportunity to sign it, it would really mean a lot. Uh, for us, but also especially for people who are concerned by these federal executions. And the second one, um, um, and the second one is to support the housing fund for Lady O. So Lady O is an abolitionist freedom fighter who just came home from jail and she's fundraising for long-term housing for her and a trans comrade. So we will also send in the follow-up email a link to that fund. So if you can donate anything, really, it would it could change definitely their life. So. If you have the chance to do it also, please do so whenever you can. So um, I would really, I mean, first of all, we're so grateful to Mike Gumbergett for joining us tonight. And um, we still have a few minutes left. And I was wondering if I could ask both of you if you have any last comments or thoughts um, for people who have stuck with us until 8.30 tonight um, on abolitionism, on how to live as an abolitionist, and how to sort of um, live in a way, I guess, that is not condoned by, or not really supported, or um, not visible, I suppose, in a way, um, in the mainstream. Well, I think the most important thing is just to start. Like, um, there's no perfect project, there's no perfect time. You just, um, you see someone that needs your help, you help them. And that's how you just start. And then, you know, and then it's something very addictive um, about helping your fellow man. And it's something very empowering about creating um, and, and building the future that you want to see. It's something that's very organic. And it's something that um, you just have lots of buy-in. So I just encourage you just to do it. Um, Ms. Gilmore says, you know, if you, one thing you have to change is everything, right? So, um, and I invite you to help someone and that will change everything for you. Yeah, on that note, um, this, this phrase that has been sitting with me um, that Maryam Kaba tweeted something along the lines of this, but I'm sure she said it better than I remember it. Um, but she tweeted something along the lines of, the gap between your values and your actions is where justice goes to die. And so thinking about that in terms of like, how are we living out our values and practicing this? Who are we working with? How are we, you know, again, just like getting involved, getting started, moving from like the book to the streets while recognizing that like we also need to be in the books and we also need, you know, we, we, need, we need everything everywhere. And so, um, yeah, just look at who's doing the work around you and see how you can support. Thank you both so much. And um, I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of the questions in the Q&A, but I am so grateful and we are so grateful um, for your questions and your participation. And as Hannah said earlier, um, we will try to circulate an email with information 
that we talked about during our conversation today, um, as well as with the links that Hannah mentioned earlier and Emilio and um, other ways to get involved. Um, we will also circulate a video recording of this with um, closed captioning up. So if you would like to share that with your friends, that would be um, amazing also. Um, Hannah, any last words? Just thank you so much for such an insightful conversation. Really, it was so great. And I'm pretty sure that we, we will still be talking about it in a few weeks. Um, thank you so, 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 so much, really. It was so interesting. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And thank you. And also a quick shout out to the, to the digital abolitionist team. They were organizing the questions, et cetera, and they have been so on top of their game. I just want to say thank you to the team. And thank you to all for coming. And we'll hopefully thank see you all soon. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye.